in action. Up next here on C-SPAN, we'll return to coverage of a hearing of the Senate Judiciary Committee. The panel met today to look at international drug control. The next witness to appear before the committee was a former drug trafficker whose face was hidden and whose voice was distorted in order to protect his identity. The, uh, the public and the press for uh, accommodating uh, a very necessary uh, requirement. Let me begin. Can you state your name for the record, your full name? Yes, Max Mermelstein. Max Mermelstein. Mr. Mermelstein, I think you're going to have to pull that microphone awfully close. In 1985, Mr. Mermelstein, you pled guilty to charges related to your smuggling activities for the Medellin cocaine cartel. Can you... In 86 that I pled guilty, Senator. In 1986? I, I was arrested in 1985. Arrested in 85 and pled guilty in 86. Can you uh, briefly summarize how you became involved in drug trafficking? Mm. To summarize, you know, it's just a matter of stating that I witnessed the murder and was allowed to live afterwards. And from that point on, I was owned by Rafael Cardona, and I was to do his bidding from then on, really. So that you witnessed the murder, were allowed to live, and from that point on, you were, to use your phrase, owned by... Rafael Cardona. Rafael Cardone, who was... Uh, um, uh, deeply involved with the cartel. Was he as uh, met his demise? He was cut down in a hail of gunfire in he, February of 80, uh, 87. He was cut down in a hail of gunfire in February 87. If uh, you had wanted to uh, uh, stop working for uh, Rafa, could you have done so? I tried on several occasions, and I was told point blank there's only two ways out, either going to jail or going out in a box. As I understand it, from 1981 to 1985, you worked full-time for the cartel and imported massive quantities of cocaine into the United States. How much cocaine were you personally responsible for importing during that time frame? During that time frame, between 55 and 56 tons of cocaine went through my hands. Between 55 and 56 tons? Mm -hmm. Now, how could you have any notion that that, about that number? Did, were, were there records kept? Records were kept, very accurate records were kept. Although the records that I personally kept were temporary, I would have to sit down with my group accountant on a regular basis and those records were then later transferred to the main books in Columbia. But my memory being what it is, I've got fairly good memory, especially with numbers. I used to keep a running tally in my head. Can you briefly describe the leaders of the Medellin cartel and their role in cocaine trafficking, at least the ones that you were involved with? Can you explain uh, and des describe the leadership of the cartel with which you... Um, the upper echelon, We'd start with uh, the Ochoa brothers, the three brothers, the oldest of which is Juan David Ochoa, the middle brother, Jorge Ochoa, and the youngest brother, Fabio Jr. Um, basically, the business was started amongst the three brothers by Juan David, who later backed out and Jorge took over and controlled it basically ever since. Um, past the Ochoa brothers, we've got Pablo Escobar, basically on the same level, probably a little bit higher right now. Um, we had Pablo Correa involved at that time in the beginning. Pablo, again, was also cut down in a hail of gunfire recently. Um, 
Gonzalo Rodriguez, gotcha, better known as El Mexicano, out of Bogota, also a very high level position in the cartel. Jairo Mejia, out of Medellin, also a very high level member of the cartel. It's fairly, well, the upper echelon, six or eight people basically, who control it uh, worldwide. But at the top were the uh, uh, Ochao brothers. Ochao is an Escobar, basically on top, yes. And Escobar is Pablo, the other name you mentioned. Pablo Escobar, yes. Sir. Pablo Escobar. Who did uh, you work for, if there was anyone you directly worked for uh, in the cartel? My basic reporting, gain of command, if you will, was through Rafael Cardona. But Cardona had a very bad habit. It was called free basing. So for the most part, I reported directly to the Ochoa brothers, especially on anything involved, sites coming in or out. So Cardona liked the product that he sold? Well, he was bliss most of the time, yes, sir. And uh, did you ever meet uh, the Ochoa brothers? Oh, yes, sir. The first one was 1978. Uh, Cardo I arranged for Cardona to sell a kilo of cocaine, which was to take place at my house in Miami. The arrangements were set, and the kilo was delivered by Fabio Ochoa, Jr. And that was the first one I met. And then in 81, I was flown down to Colombia at the request of Jorge. Fabio, the youngest brother? Yes, he is, sir. Go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, in April of 81, Jorge requested that I fly down to Colombia to meet him and several other members of the cartel, which I did. And I again flew down and met with him and several other members to Panama in, later on in 81, the same year. So you have, uh, you had a personal acquaintance with all three brothers? Yes, I did, sir. And Escobar as well, I assume? I met Escobar on several occasions, the first time being in 1981 in Panama. Now, when you went to Colombia, did you actually... Uh, uh, go to the uh, Choa's residence, or did you, uh, was there a... We went to uh, La Hacienda Veracruz, which is uh, Jorge's farm out on the coast. In 1985, you were arrested for drug smuggling charges in Los Angeles, and you later pled guilty to reduce charges, and you've been cooperating with the U.S. authorities since then, including today. I've been trying to. I've been reading a lot of friction doing that, yes, sir. Now, you say you've been trying to. There's been friction building. Can you, uh, can you tell me what you mean by that? I'd like to be more actively involved than I am, and I'm just being held back. I've tried to initiate several investigations that nobody wants to start up, and you know, I'm it's just... Oh, I've been told point blank by one agent, big cases, big problems, small cases, small problems, and right now he didn't want any problems. So I'm meeting a lot of resistance. Big cases, big problems, small cases, small problems, and this particular agent told you he didn't want any problems. That's correct. This is a customs agent. Customs agent. Why can you describe how you were arrested and, uh, uh, and what cooperation you have been able to provide thus far? Would you repeat that about being... Can you describe how you were arrested in, uh, under what circumstances in 1985 in Los Angeles? I wasn't arrested in Los Angeles, and I was arrested in uh, Broward County, Florida. But there were, sm were smuggling charges? Out of Los Angeles, yes, sir. Okay. I was an offshoot of the DeLorean case. The cocaine and DeLorean case was supplied by us. But um, I was arrested in Florida, uh, charged in Florida, and transported to California. My cooperation basically started, oof, I was arrested in June, and when I was arrested, there was a piece of paper in my pocket which had a good deal of personal data about Adler Barry Seal, who was a government witness at that time. Uh, knowing that I had this paper in my pocket, I immediately notified the boys in Columbia hold the contract. At this time there was a contract on Barry Seal and they had me looking actively for Barry Seal. I told them that I had been arrested and I had this paper on me. To make this clear now, Barry Seal was a former or present at the time, at that time? At that time, 
was cooperating with the government. No. He was he was cooperating with the government, but was not in the witness protection program. Is that no, correct? No, he was not, sir. He declined the witness protection program. Were you uh, asked? You uh, used the word contract. The the Ochoa brothers and their organization had a contract. That means a a uh, they were offering money for the death kidnapping or death of uh, Mr. Seal, is that right? It was related to me directly by Fabio Ochoa Jr. on the telephone, along with Pablo Escobar personally, either kidnap him or kill him. I wasn't asked to do this, I was told to do this. You were told to do this, okay. Now, I, let's go back. So you had that information about the, the uh, desire to kidnap and or kill Seal on your possession? When what you were arrested? Had, what I had on my possession, Senator, was a piece of paper which was written by Rafael Cardona with personal information about SEAL, uh, his home address, um, registry numbers on a couple of his airplanes, his places of business, some of the cars that he and his family were driving, um, locator information, if you will. Gotcha. Okay. And when I told uh, the boys in Colombia that this piece of paper was found on my person when I was arrested and to hold off on the entire operation. I was told point blank, no, it's going ahead full steam and they're bringing in a team from Colombia to finish it off. So now I'm not only looking at drug charges, I'm looking at the possibility of uh, conspiracy to commit murder. And I wasn't particularly interested in killing anybody anyway. So I had my attorney notify the government about the contract on seal and the government knew about it in July of uh, 85. So that was the beginning of the, of the cooperation. The first piece of information you gave the government That's correct. was that SEAL was, if you will, under contract. That's correct. And that you had been asked to uh, <clears throat> do the work originally, and now that you were incarcerated, that the Columbia boys, as you refer to it, were still going to go ahead and attempt to kill SEAL. That's correct, Senator. Now, what is your current status? As far as what, Senator? Well, you served some time in prison, did you or did you not? I did. I served uh, a little over two years. A little over two years. And I'm on lifetime special parole. And lifetime special parole, is that That's the correct, phrase? Senator. And you are, unlike SEAL, you are in the witness protection program. I know who I'm dealing with, Senator. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Are you under any obligation as a consequence of that arrangement reached between you and the federal government? No, that contract between myself and the federal government has been satisfied. So that you are not required under the law to be here today testifying? Under the law, no, but morally I feel I am. You say morally. Why have you chosen to do it? I created a lot of havoc, and I'd just like to do the best that I can to try and straighten it out. And the havoc I assume you're referring to that you created was the supply of these drugs and the impact they've had upon American society and individuals' lives. That's correct, Senator. Mr. Merbelstein, I'd like to discuss briefly uh, how the smuggling uh, process, the smuggling of cocaine, uh, works. Uh, who the leaders of the cartel are, and you've mentioned them, and, and their control of the U.S. cocaine market. Um, much of this is very basic, I know, and obviously second nature to you. You know it well and has been widely reported in the press already. But I think it would be useful to have our assumptions about the cartel's operation verified by you here on the record before this committee. So let me begin at the beginning. The coca leaf is mainly grown in Bolivia and Peru, where it is processed to make a raw cocoa paste. Where is that processing done and by whom? In Bolivia and Peru, it's basically done in the jungle by the Indians, although there is one section in Colombia itself, the Calca Valley, where the coca leaf is also produced. So that the bulk of it that is grown in Bolivia and Purdue, it is turned into raw coca paste in Bolivia and Peru. That's Peru. correct, sir. 
And, and the Indians mainly do that, you say? Yes, sir. Does the cartel control this phase of the coca trade? Uh, not really, Senator, no. Um, the Bolivian end of the operation is controlled by Roberto Suarez and his family. Although Roberto is in jail, I'm quite sure that he still maintains very rigid control of his business. How does uh, transportation of this, this uh, paste make it from Peru and Bolivia into Colombia. I assume it moves into Colombia where it moves from the next phase. Uh, yes, it's taken from the jungles of Bolivia and Peru into the laboratories either in Colombia or when Tranquilandia went down. I don't know where the lab new laboratories are being established, but there was a lot of talk about northern Brazil. Um, it's flown from the jungle processing labs of the paste into the labs for the crystallization. And by crystallization, you mean that's where it's turned into the powder, the powdered cocaine? Into the cocaine hydrochloride, yes, that, sir. That uh, most people know of as being, chlor as being uh, uh, cocaine. That's correct. Now, how is it transported from this, uh, from this new refined product now that most people know as cocaine? This, uh, how is it transported from Colombia into the United States? Many, many different ways. Commercial carriers, body carriers, private planes, boats. What does the bulk of it come in? And let's talk about the 50-some tons that you were responsible for. Having All of that came in private plane and small boats. Now, to the best of what is your estimation, although you've been out of the loop for a little while, do you have any reason to believe that that is still let me put it this way. What do you think the major means by which it's being smuggled now? Is this, you think it's pro, pr primarily the same? And how do they rank? Is it private Pri planes rank? Primarily the same, no. Although I would say about 40% of the 40 to 45% coming into the country is still coming in a private plane. A good deal now, and the larger shipments are coming in on commercial carrier, uh, cargo ships, um, commercial aircraft in, in cargoes, in shipments. Why would that be? Why the change? That's basically the way the cartel has been able to exist and flourish is that they can change faster than the United States government can. The United States government you know, setting up to stop all air traffic coming into the United States. Surveillance planes, radar. So they're watching that window. We'll open up another one. We'll bring it in by boat. You start watching water, we'll switch back to the airplanes. Their ability to change fast is what's basically kept them alive. And the fact that the United States government will change as soon as, you know, it goes through the bureaucratic process, the mistake that we're making basically is not leaving the first operation, in effect, and going to the second operation. When you say the mistake we're making, you mean the, the mistake that the United States government is making? That's, that's correct, Senator. And so you're suggesting that as we go to a new phase or operation, the old one should be left in place. So, for example, if the radar and air surveillance is working better than it was back when you were actively involved, we should not do anything to dislocate that. Definitely not. And we should move then to try to beef up our ability to deal with dealing with commercial aircraft and commercial vessels. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Just before I was arrested, Cardona and Escobar went partnership on a couple of thousand ton cargo ships. So the ships are moving in and out also. So they actually the cartel actually owns commercial cargo ships that also conduct, quote, legitimate business as well as illegitimate business. That's correct, Senator. As a matter of fact, we also bought oh, a Mallard seaplane in the United States and several widgets and had those shipped to Columbia. They shipped pilots up to me. We had them trained in seaplane operations and sent them back to Columbia.
How many Colombian drug cartels are that? You worked for one of them. How many as far competitors as did you have? There aren't any competitors really. You know, well, now there are because there's so much cocaine that the market is limited. But the big problem when I was in it was getting it up fast enough to be distributed. The problem was that there was more demand than there was supply. Um, as far as other cartels, in my personal opinion, there's only one real organization that's out of Medellin. The other groups, the group out of Cali, the group out of Barranquilla, it's a regional operation, but they don't have the close cooperation and the close ties that you have in the Medellin group. Uh, again, in my own opinion, there would only be one formal cartel, so to speak. Now, is that one, is there only one cartel within the Medellin region? Is that a single cartel? Is that the one that you worked for, or are there others within that region? Um, as one organized group, there's one major group. There are hundreds of independents in the Medellin yeah. area. What percentage of the U.S. cocaine markets do these uh, um, cartels control? Uh, uh, um, a, the Medellin cartels, and then the cartels generally. I mean, are they, is, is all the cocaine in the United States come from Colombia? What percentage of it, and what percentage, if you can tell us in your estimation, comes from the cartel you worked with? Okay, in my estimation, Medellin is shipping approximately 60%. I figure Cali for about 15%, and their end of the market is growing little by little. Um, Barranquilla, 5 8%. Independence, another five percent, and I would not be surprised at this time if growing and processing labs are in existence in Jamaica and uh, Haiti. How did you all use the Jamaicans and Haitians, if at all, or were they completely separate and distinct from your operation? One of the pilots that we utilized on a from time to time basis would fly through Jamaica. Uh, are other people, no. I know Jamaica was being used as an interim landing point, and Cuba was being used as an interim landing point, and Haiti was established also. But my group had no need for it, basically. You were able to do it one-stop shopping. You just went straight from Colombia to the United States. Uh, in 81, yes, it was direct flights in. 82, 3, and 4, it was an intermediate in the Bahamas, and 85, uh, just before I was arrested, I brought in three direct flights again. Now, how much do the leaders of, uh, of the cartel that you were involved with, the Ochea cartel, how much uh, would you say they make in profit? I don't know, I'm used to big numbers, but that's a beauty. Uh, I figure them to be well over a billion dollars on each one of them, as far as you know, personal wealth is concerned. One over, well, well over, over one billion dollars. Yes, uh, billion dollar figure. I would go with Escobar, El Mexicano, the Ochoas as a group, the three brothers, and probably Jairo Mejia also. So the Ochoa brothers as a group, you would guess in one year, make a billion dollars? The three of them to combine? No, I, yeah. Hmm. How directly are the uh, Ochoa brothers, for example, involved in uh, in their own smuggling operation? How directly do they personally get involved? Or do they sit back there in their, in their estates and their farms and in front of their computers laundering their money uh, um, and just uh, directing it all? I mean, how, how, how do they? They take a personal interest, especially in the, in the people that are working for them. And basically, they want to meet me because they wanted to know who they were dealing with. That's why I was brought down originally. And their biggest point is making sure that we've got everything we need, that we're satisfied, and that everything's going okay.
Are they involved in such things as the day-to-day -day hiring of pilots or security or the money laundering folks? No, sir. Now, how far down the line do you have to get before there is someone involved, for example, in the, in the details of the money laundering operation? One step below. There is only one person, in my estimation, that knows the entire operation end-to-end -end and what's going on anywhere in the world at any given time, and that's the controller of the organization. That gentleman's nickname is Hota. Kota? Hota. Hota. J-O-T-A, which stands for the, it's the letter J. And does that person work directly for the brothers? He works directly for the cartel. He's not only controlling brothers' money and merchandise, he's controlling Escobar's, El Mexicano's. He's got the books, the master books, if you will, over the entire operation. The entire operation of that cartel or other cartels as well? No, the Medellin group. Med How directly does the cartel control the distribution of drugs in the United States? Do they just merely get it here and get it to the wholesaler, if you will? Or do they, uh, the are wholesaler. they involved in who has what market within the United States and who has what corner, so to speak? They are the wholesaler in the United States, Senator. It's their people that are sent up to take care of that. Give me an example of what you mean. Oh. Uh, during the time that I was bringing it into Miami, well, in late 83, 84, and part of 85, I was taking care of some of their distribution. But they did always maintain their own distribution network in the United States, which had one supervisor which controlled Miami, Houston, New York, and California. Each individual distribution network had its own head in place in the various areas. So there was... There was one person that controlled the cities you named, and then within that city, each of those cities, there was another person in charge of that city reporting to that control person? That's correct, Senator. All these people were handpicked in Colombia and sent up from Colombia. Now, how, how far down the line, within a city, within Miami, for example, or within New York, within Houston, you had one person handpicked by the cartel who answered to for lack of a better phrase, a regional manager. Who Good had, analogy. Now, how far down the line did that hand-picking of distributors go by the cartel? Did it stop there? The man that runs the United States was picked by the cartel. The men in charge of the individual regions were picked by the cartel. And basically from that point on, the people are on their own. I see. So the person who ran the operation in Houston for the cartel, he or she picked their own people That's correct, from sir. that point down. He was also responsible for the actions of the people that he picked. Give me an example of what you mean by that, responsible for the actions. If there is Cardona was responsible for my actions. Car so although you answered to Cardona, even though he liked his own product too much, that he was blitzed or whatever the phrase, would you say? Would blitzed. Blitzed most of the time. Um, uh, anything happened to him when you uh, were arrested or when you turned he state was, seven? He was killed, sir. He was killed. That's something happening. As I see it, there are basically uh, three ways that we in government have looked at uh, dealing with international drug production. The first way is to attempt to stop drugs at the source through eradication. The second is to try to interdict the drugs en route from a foreign country to the United States. And the third is to attempt to go after the leaders of the organizations, our cartels, and, and bring them to justice. Now, in your experience with dealing both indirectly and directly with the leaders of a significant drug cartel. Did you get the impression that the leaders of the cartel were afraid that U.S. eradication efforts would ever wipe out their crop, their source crop? 
No, Senator. The only thing the cartel is afraid of is American justice. That's it. The only thing the cartel is afraid of is American justice? That's correct. What about trying to destroy the labs in Bolivia or Peru or Colombia or northern uh, um, Brazil uh, um, now uh, um, that process this camp, this uh, cocaine? Are the traffickers afraid that uh, this strategy on the part of the United States might work? It can't. That hits the street. That, that, that is not able to work. No, what we do is we state in the press what area is going to be hit during what program at what particular time. Plus the fact we're dealing with the local police and the local governments in South America. That's a direct line to the cartel. Why is dealing with the local governments to state the obvious question? I think it's clear what the answer is, but for the record, why is dealing with the local governments and the local police a direct line to the cartel? They own them. Now, that's a broad statement. They own them. Can you give me an example? They own them through one or two methods, either through bribes or through fear. They take the money or they die. And they've proven what they can do. So that, is there any place in Bolivia, Peru, or Colombia that you know of, that you knew of, up to the time that you were no longer in the network, which was uh, 87, I believe, 86, your arrest. Mm -hmm. 85. Or, excuse me, A85. Is there any place in any one of those areas where you believe that there was a police agency and or governmental entity that the United States could reliably deal with without the information getting to the cartel? In Colombia, a high-ranking military, a high-ranking military. Cartel is also afraid of these people. We're basically talking with you know, the old feudal class system, the military class, you know, the generals that have been generations of military people, and people whose integrity cannot be bought, and people who have the troops to back up their own protection. How about in any of the other countries? Bolivia. Suarez owns the government, owns the military, and Peru is, from all I've been able to read, is virtually a communist country today. So, During the time you were importing cocaine, U.S. agencies were spending uh, billions of dollars attempting to interdict drugs at the borders. Why, uh, why weren't we more successful? I give you a thousand different answers to that question. Uh, again, the governmental frequencies that law enforcement and interdiction use are published frequencies. You mean radio frequencies? That's correct, Senator. We had people that were assigned nothing but radio duty. They would sit in front of an HF radio, a high frequency radio, 24 hours a day, listening to see if they could pick up the frequencies that the government was using, and when the government changed frequencies, picking up the new frequencies. If we didn't have the current government frequencies, we just wouldn't fly. So you had the frequency before you even took off the ground? Or we would not take off, that's correct. What are some of the other reasons why we didn't succeed in our interdiction effort? More, f You've got a tremendous lack of cooperation between your agencies. I mean, a tremendous lack of cooperation. The FBI won't tell the DEA what they're doing. The DEA won't tell the FBI what they're doing. Nobody wants to talk to customs. You know, everybody's got their own specialties. Everybody wants the headlines, and everybody wants the budget appropriations. So everybody's out to make their own record, and nobody wants to help anybody else. How would that affect what you were doing? Would you play off against, I mean, other than the generalized notion that you're portraying for us that the agencies didn't cooperate, therefore there was less uh, bang for the buck. Um, did it have any specific application to what you did or didn't do? I mean, no, it's just the fact that the government wasn't establishing any penetrations. The only ones they could pick up, okay, they could pick up a captain, a boat captain, or the street people or things like that. But getting into the higher levels where they have to get to stop them, they're not allowed to do it. What do you mean they're not allowed to do it? 
in order to set up a proper penetration, the way a penetration should be set up, you're going to have to establish a man's credibility within the organization. The only way to establish a man's credibility within the organization is to allow kilos to hit the street. And to, to allow kilos to hit the street. To hit the street. The DEA is not prepared to do this. Uh, I think they're precluded by law from doing it, although the FBI is notorious for doing it. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, of judgment. You know, my personal opinion is the only way it can be done. I'd rather have 200 kilos hit the street occasionally than allow 15,000 kilos a month to come through on a month-to-month -month basis. You know, if you want to go after it, you go after the top, taking street people off the streets. All that's going to do is fill up the jails because there are more street people than you can jail. So that your impression is that the DEA cannot penetrate because they cannot participate in making sure that a drug shipment of cocaine coming from Colombia actually gets onto the streets of Miami, New York, or Wilmington, Delaware, or wherever else. That's correct. They cannot establish the credibility of an undercover man that they try and put in. Let me go back to uh, our interdiction effort. Uh, the Coast Guard and the Customs Service, both of whom uh, watch the borders of South Florida, have had some additional financial input in terms of their budgets to try to be more successful. How did you manage to fly in 56 tons of cocaine and, as I understand it, only lose one plane load That's correct, Senator. during this entire time? That's correct. I mean, the airlines don't do that well. I know. Knowing where they are in respect to where we are is the key to the entire operation. Were you able to penetrate the Coast Guard or the Customs Service? It wasn't necessary. But did you? No. And it wasn't necessary to penetrate them because, as you pointed out, you could determine what radio frequencies they were going to be using, and they used those radio... What, what significance does the radio frequency have to do with whether or not your flight from Colombia or the Bahamas, if it's had to stop, from Colombia or the Bahamas has to do with getting into the state of Florida. We knew where their planes and boats were, and we knew what they were doing. We would just avoid those areas. So by, um, for the record, by knowing what frequencies they were using, you could identify and locate where their planes and boats were. We were monitoring their planes and boats during our entire mission. So you monitored them. That's correct. So that you obviously, if you knew where they were, you knew where not to go. That's correct. How about the one time you got caught? What happened? We were testing new plane, and we broke air defense command. We were too high and too fast. But even though we were intercepted, that plane landed empty. They did not get one gram of cocaine, except oh, the following day they found it floating in the Gulf of Mexico. But when that plane was forced down, it was empty and clean. The pilots were released that night. It was a few days later that they went back to get them. One they got, the other one was gone. How are the... Uh, let's move away from your product, the cocaine, to individual personnel. How are South American traffickers, whether they are at the top of a cartel, or as you pointed out, the people at the second level of an organization, the person who is in charge of the, the uh, um, well, for example, Cardona. He, he was a Colombian, right? That's correct, Senator. A Colombian citizen, not a U.S. citizen? Colombian national, that's correct, Senator. A Colombian national. How is he able to get in and out of the United States so easily? Cardona had two or three Colombian passports, all of which had American visas. Cardona also had several Venezuelan passports with American visas. Cardona also had a Mexican passport with American visa, and Cardona had an American passport. <laughs> all of which were purchased through various and sundry people involved with the paperwork industry. 
Well, let me let me ask you this: Is it your impression, notwithstanding the fact you're displeased with the lack of cooperation or the lack of you, the failure to fully utilize what you know now in order to make a dent in cocaine trafficking? Is it your impression from what you knew then and what you know now, when I say then, prior to your arrest, and what you know now, that U.S. authorities, U.S. officials, have knowledge of who individual leaders are within the various cartels, that they actually have their pictures in a book. They, they know what these people look like. They know their names. They know who they are. Or, or are, they, are the individuals who are the leaders of the various cartels, in your view, totally unknown to the uh, U.S. authorities? U.S. authorities know who they are and do have photographs of them. Now, why is it? Let me ask another one. Aren't, uh, aren't the airports uh, um, in Colombia, for example, being watched? Um, uh, or do these folks come in uh, through uh, aircraft just, I mean, do they ride along with the cocaine? The big boys don't normally ride along with the product. Um, as far as the airport, airports in Colombia and where they travel, any travel that they do normally is done on their own private planes. And we're talking Falcon jets on down. Um, as far as immigration customs in South America and Central America, they have no worries or problems at all. As an example, in Cardona's office in Colombia, he opened up his safe one day and had a complete set of immigration stamps from Panama, Costa Rica, and Colombia. He used to stamp his own passports. As far as passing through the airport, a hundred dollar bill inside your passport, they don't open anything or ask any questions. You just walk right through. Would it be of any value in terms of knowing how and when these people were coming in and out of the country to, uh, to have U.S. personnel on the ground in Colombia at these airports as just observing? tailing these people to use for lack of a better phrase to what you know if they're in Colombia we can't touch them no I'm not suggesting to touch them just so we know they're coming and going the only reason I would want to know that they were going is to know where they were going and see if they could be arrested in the country that they're going to but as far as following them within Colombia itself it's useless you know it's no, I just no meant purpose. in terms of their embarkation from well let me let me, let me go to another point. It appears from uh, your description of the cartel's operation that fairly high-level traffickers uh, would be in the United States a good deal of the time to oversee the importation and distribution operation. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And you've just told me that the reason the DEA has not been able to penetrate the organizations in the United States and thereby arrest these supervisors, if you will, is because they are not allowed to participate in the distribution of the cocaine to establish their credibility for the superior who we're looking to get. Is that That's correct? correct, Senator. What are some of the areas in which you think the cartel is vulnerable? If you were heading the operation, if I, uh, if I made you head of the D, as if I could, if I made you head of the DEA, what, what would you be doing that DEA is not doing in order to be able to um, either penetrate the cartel or just generally, where are they vulnerable? The first place of vulnerability would be the crop. I'd spray. I'd use a herbicide specially directed to an alkaloid, which the coca plant is, to destroy only an alkaloid, and just spray Bolivia, Peru, and Colombia. You eliminate the crop, 
you eliminate the rest of the problem. We'd have to step on a few toes, but you know, we're dealing with generations of American lives. The is it? I am led to believe that there is a. It takes only a small percentage of land, relatively speaking, to produce the totality of the raw material needed to supply all the U.S. market. Is that, is that correct? I don't know if I'm correct in this or not, Senator, but I've been told that it takes approximately 200 kilos of coca leaves to produce one kilo of cocaine hydrochloride, and that's a lot of leaves. We're talking plantations of coca plants. What do you think the impact would be? We just heard testimony from a uh, U.S. general, come down to the Marine Corps, and he made the point that the cartels have been wise enough, like other, he made the analogy to, to guerrilla war operations, they have been wise enough to take care of not only the people in their direct organization, but within the communities, build schools and churches, uh, provide jobs. Uh, uh, how how large a piece of their peace and prosperity does that play? And how, to the extent that you know, how, how involved are they in that end of the process, even though you weren't? Very, very much involved. Oh, I was. I used to ship a lot of sporting equipment from the United States for the poor towns in Colombia for distribution down there. Uh, they're very much involved. Um, on Cardona's Ranch, there were three small towns within the ranch property itself. On Veracruz, Jorge's property, there are five or six small towns. These towns are, they owe their livelihood and subsistence to these people. Escobar has put up low-income housing through the slums of Medellin and the outlying areas for the poor people with no charge. And they take the Robin Hood approach in Colombia, if you will. The poor people are their basic protection. It's their basic workforce also. What would be the effect in your view, I'm not asking you to make foreign policy, but I'm curious, what would be the effect in your view if we took the unprecedented action you're suggesting, and that is just go in to use your phrase, stepped on a few toes and, and used herbicides to eradicate the crop. What effect would that have on uh, the attitude of all those folks who aren't part of the cartel about the United States. Senator, 90 to 95 percent of the Colombian people are good, honest, hard-working people that would like as much to stop this traffic as we would. I don't think we'd have a problem with the populace. I think the big problem would be with the government officials who are cooperating with the cartel. Is there a way of making it more difficult uh, for the traffickers to communicate with each other. Obviously, communications is a, is a major part of the success or failure of a trafficking operation. Is there anything we can do to make it more difficult? A lot of things we can do. The first thing is make one slight change in telephone company procedure and totally follow up their communications within the United States. And the only thing we have to do there is on the pay phones. Make sure they're outgoing calls only and that they cannot receive an incoming call. And you completely eliminate their beepers and communication system in the United States. Make sure I understand. That sounds so simple uh, <laughs> that uh, it, uh, it has a ring of, uh, of truth to it. If I understand what you're saying, right now, pay phone, I can call out but I can also receive a call. That's correct, Senator. So if I stand at a payphone, I dial you, or I give you a preordained number, I tell you I'm going to be at the corner of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Madison and Second, um, that a payphone number is such and such, you can contact me at a certain time. You can call through. That's correct, Senator. Now, the ability of someone from to be able to contact an individual through a payphone, what significance does that have in terms of the operation of a trafficking operation? 
a tremendous significance. The entire operation is predicated on the communication and getting in contact with the people that this, the cocaine is going to be given to and where the money is going to be received from. None of this communication is handled through somebody's home phone. They're afraid of using a home phone because of interception of the line. They use pay phones and they're constantly changing pay phones. And the way it's set up is through the beeper systems. Everybody walks around with a beeper, they call from a pay phone, and they return a call from a pay phone. What do you mean they're, they're contact through a beeper system? The paging systems. The, the paging system. Mm -hmm. So someone would be paged from a pay phone through their beeper to go to a pay phone? That's correct, Senator. I would be called on a regular basis across my pager, and I would not return a phone call across my pager from my home phone. I'd jump in a car, drive a couple of miles to a pay phone, and return that call from a payphone. And the inability of someone to be able to, how, how, how does that affect receiving a call from a payphone? So now you make a call. You, I you call can, another payphone. You call another payphone. If that payphone cannot receive a phone call, and it can be set up that a payphone cannot receive a phone call, I'm going to have to call him at home, or he's going to have to call me at home. And that sets a firm point firm location, which the government can interdict on. It sets a pattern that didn't exist before. Let's talk about money laundering for a minute. Um, I understand that, that uh, legitimate business assist the cartel on laundering money. How do they do that, if you could give us an example, where legitimate businesses assist the cartel in laundering their money? Legitimate businesses in Colombia basically exist because of, you know, excuse the expression, narco dollars in the United States. You said narco, not arco. Narco. Narco. Um, Colombia, Colombian law restricts the amount of money that can be sent out of the country for foreign purchases. These large, I'm talking about large industrials, your sugar industry, cement industry, uh, the textile mills, all need equipment and raw materials from the United States. This has to be purchased, so they need dollars available in the United States. They can't get too much of those dollars out of Colombia, or not enough for what they need. But yet the drug dealers have all of this excess money in the United States and want the pesos in Colombia. It's just a symbiotic relationship. We supply the dollars in the United States, you return it to us in pesos in Colombia. But how are the legitimate businesses involved in it? Be, be, be very basic and for, for, for the record. A cement, um, a cement mill or a sugar mill needs $15, $18 million worth of new equipment to be purchased in the United States. They need that money in the United States, and they can't get it out of Colombia. So they're contacted by a drug dealer who has that money in the United States, turns that money over to legitimate business in the United States, and the legitimate business in Colombia pays the bill in the local currency. I see. Do you know anything about the end product of laundered money in terms of gaining control of legitimate businesses in the U.S.? That is. Colombian cocaine imported by you, sold in the United States, large amount of money and cash available. That cash is then laundered, usually through offshore banks, I assume. Uh, we shipped a lot of it directly into Colombia also. Okay, but the, that portion that's laundered in the United States ends up coming back to the United States as legitimate money. What do you know, if at all, about the involvement of those dollars being invested in U.S. corporations that are otherwise legitimate. Do you, for example, do, do these guys, uh, do the brothers uh, um, play the stock market? Do they have significant investments in, uh, um, in any uh, U.S. Uh, um, uh, uh, banks, automobile agencies, uh, um, chemical well, corporations? Most of the investments that they had in the United States, and they're small, they didn't like to invest too much money in the United States. Most of those, most of those investments were 
taken by the U.S. government during Operation Zulu in Miami. They prefer investing in Colombia and in South America? Colombia and South America. There are large investments in Spain. There are investments in Holland and France. There are also in, uh, large bank accounts in Luxembourg and Switzerland. They're diversified. The diamond market in Israel is a big place for investment for them at present time. Say that again, please. The Israeli diamond market. The Israeli diamond market. They're converting a lot of cash into diamonds. Of all the things the U.S. government could do to crack down on the cartel, what do the traffickers fear most, if there's any one thing? American justice, as I stated earlier. The American, of, American justice. The that is be, being actually physically brought before an American court. That's correct, Senator, because it's something that they cannot control, something they cannot buy. What about the U.S. military? Is there any discussion or worry about uh, direct or multilateral action against them, against the cartel? Are they worried that one day the Congress or the President may say, okay, we're going to authorize uh, U.S. military troops to move against, uh, to invade uh, with the, you know... I'd love to see it happen. Well, I, I, I know you'd love to see it happen, but I'm trying to get a sense of what what their concern is. I mean, is there, was there ever discussion that, that they worry someday that instead of them being able to buy the government, that the government may very well be able to be turned by the United States? No, Senator. No worries at all. So there's no worries that U.S. pressure would be able to uh, um, override their, their ability to control government heads, government agencies in Colombia and other countries? Senator, we can pressure them with economics and items like that, the cartel is threatening them with their lives. You know, it's just a matter of weighing what they're being threatened with. The cartel threat is a little bit more intense. You indicated earlier that one of the places that they had not penetrated, to the best of your knowledge, was the elite military, uh, the high command of the Colombian military. That's correct. Do they worry that there could be a uh, a military coup and an invitation from the Colombian military to the United States or other multinational agencies, military agencies, to come in and, and, uh, and, and go after them? Not unless martial law is declared. The Colombian government is a democratic government. It's the yeah. presidency. And unless martial law is declared, the military can't act on its own. So as I understand it, their view is pretty basic. They according to you, basically own the, 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 the civilian government along with the judicial system. And the one place they fear, that is the high-ranking military, they believe because they own the other two branches, they are not in a democracy, quote-unquote, in any jeopardy from those folks. That's correct. As a matter of fact, Senator, Juan David Ochoa bragged to me on one occasion that he personally paid for 75 percent of Third Body's campaign. So. Do you have a sense that the Colombian people, the, the 90 to 95 percent you said, quote, are good people and would like it stopped, do you have a sense that they believe that their government is controlled by? They know for a fact that their government is controlled by. You indicated that there was a good deal of uh, bickering among federal agencies who were required to participate in the effort to uh, stop drugs. Uh, how big an improvement would it be if that one thing could stop? How, how much would it in, uh, impact on the effect? I know you can't quantify it percentage-wise, but give me your sense of what impact that would have. Okay. In my personal estimation right now, there's somewhere between a 30 and 40 percent overlap in what the DEA, FBI, and Customs are doing. By that I mean that they're investigating the same people at the same time and not sharing the information. This is an overlap of manpower and funds, so we can cut that out. Basic coordination between the agencies, 
you know, let each agency do what they're specialized in doing. And in my own estimation, as far as controlling the street, it's the DEA, the best street people in the world. Support for the DEA should be done through the FBI, who are the best detail men in the world, but who are terrible in a street operation. And anything up to the borders of the United States should be handled by customs. That's where their big strong point is. But again, it's got to be coordinated in such a way that these people talk to each other. Right now, every agency has its own computer, and nobody has access to anybody else's computer. And nobody gives anybody else information of what they're doing. And I'll give you a perfect example. I was pulled out for a debriefing session eight, ten months ago. You were pulled out for a debriefing session? That's correct, Senator. By whom? By the DEA. They wanted to corroborate a report that they had received uh, from an FBI debriefing session, something that they thought I would know something about. Now, for me to be transported to the debriefing session is a complicated and an expensive proposition for the government. You see the way I move. Plus, it's a dangerous situation for myself and my family. Okay. The debriefing session is set up, and I'm moved to point X. I sit down with the DEA agent, and they start going through the questions that they have for this me. This is merely 10 months ago? Approximately. Roughly. Okay. And start going through the questions, and I start answering the questions. And this agent gets a very strange look on their face and asks me if I have ever been debriefed by the FBI on this particular subject. And I stated that, yes, I had. And I was asked if I was assigned a code name by the FBI. The FBI likes using code names instead of uh, CI numbers, confidential informant numbers. And I said, yes, I was. I was asked if I knew it, and I told them that I did. I told them what that code name was, and the papers just flew up in the air. They were debrief debriefing me and using me to corroborate my own statements. When these papers were given to the DEA, the DEA agent asked specifically who codename such and such is and were given false information. Now, let me get this straight. <laughs> Ten months ago, in the wake of all our new cooperation that's now taking place, Ten months ago, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, wanted to speak to you because they thought you might be able to corroborate information that they had relating to an investigation they had underway. No, this was information that was given to them by the FBI. Okay, so no, the FBI they, gave them information. Bear in mind that this information was given by me to the FBI okay. three and a half years ago. Okay, three and a half years ago you sat down with the FBI, you gave them information. Ten months ago that information, which was on, in a report, on a piece of paper or pieces of paper, was contained a code name, the source of the information. That's the correct, DEA sir. agent had asked the FBI at some point, prior to speaking to you, who was code name X. Correct. The FBI apparently told that DEA agent, code name X is Charlie Smith. Exactly. You sit down, and now they're looking to have you cooperate with Charlie Smith told the FBI. Except and it I turns out Charlie you're Smith. Charlie Smith. That's correct, sir. Because the FBI wouldn't even tell the DEA that it was you who had given them the information. That's correct. All right. Mr. Mermelstein, the Colombian cartels, obviously, from what you tell us and what we know, are run like a sophisticated business. They have market plans, they have lawyers, they have accountants, they have bankers, they have people expert in a whole range of things from investments uh, um, to transportation. They can afford to pay for the finest expertise in the world and aren't afraid to do so. Although the cocaine trade provides enormous profits, are they looking at new businesses to get themselves involved in? 
or is it they just see the cocaine gravy train there as long as they need it? Or, I mean, is there any? No, Escobar, Pablo Escobar is an extremely ambitious individual. Sometime mid to late 1983, he started experimenting with and growing poppies in Colombia for the production of heroin in Colombia. He brought the poppies, the plants, and the people in from the Far East and established his own heroin industry in Colombia. Was there, was there any success? Well, he's shipping heroin into the United States today. Are they developing any, uh, any new drugs? There's a good deal of talk about synthetic and designer drugs. Synthetic cocaine has been on the market as far back as I can remember. It's, you know, it can be produced in a laboratory, but uh, it doesn't, you know, from what I understand, it doesn't have the same effect or, I don't know, it just never caught on. As far as synthetic drugs, all kinds of designer drugs and synthetic drugs are being produced and have been produced here in the United States. Your methamphetamines, your B2B, your speeds, things like that. But they're not involved in that, to the best of your knowledge. Not any longer. At one time, they were involved with quaaludes when quaaludes were a big thing in the United States, but they dropped that end of it completely. They had their own factories in Colombia producing uh, bootleg quaaludes. They're not afraid to diver diversify. How about crack cocaine? Crack, crack is cocaine. It's base cocaine. Basically, what's done is the crystal cocaine is shipped to the United States and what they call thrown back into base through chemical process. It's run back one step before it got here. It's cocaine base is all it is. But I mean, are they, the cartel, involved in, to use, to use your phrase, taking it back one step? Are they involved in the distribution, sale, crack? No, Senator, that's done by the street people. You know, we're talking well beyond the wholesaler level now. What's next with these uh, entrepreneurial gentlemen who now have access to and apparently have amassed billions of dollars in personal wealth? Uh, where do you see them going? Or is it just, are they... I see them going to jail if somebody develops enough intestinal fortitude to do something about it. And what's the most important thing we could do to get them to jail? go down and pick them up. Now, when you say go down and pick them up, uh, you mean like the Israelis did Eichmann years ago, uh, just physically go down and... Or like the Israelis did to the Sheikh just recently. Yes. Yes. Are they worried about that? Very much so. How, what form does that worry take? Do they have large... Bodyguards, bodyguards individual security. armies, personal protection, unbelievable stashes of arms and equipment. Do they, they, they must have some sense of the impact that the drug addiction that they are spawning is having in their own country, Colombia. I mean, I, uh, Colombia itself is not only uh, an exporting country, it is a consuming country, and increasingly so. Is that not correct? This is correct. As a matter of fact, the problem that we're having in the United States now with crack, they had in Colombia in the early 80s. The problem is basically stabilized down there. There is a small amount of use, but most of the people that were involved with it died off, have been killed off. Are they worried that there might be a military coup? In Colombia? In Colombia? No, Senator. Not a concern of it? No. What about so-called bazooka, uh, the, you know, the raw cocaine paste, which seems to be a place that, that we're going in that's terms the of Columbia, That's the Colombian form of crack. Right. Basically what that is, the crack that's being used in the United States is the hydrochloride being taken back a step. Bazooka, what the Colombians use, is the base before it's converted into the crystal hydrochloride. 
Well, that's becoming a extremely lucrative market that is crack or whatever phrase we want to use, the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the raw cocaine paste taking it back a step is become an, an extremely lucrative financial market here in the United States. It's also a lot easier to ship center. It is a lot easier? Yes, it is. It's more stable. It doesn't, isn't affected by water. It's virtually indestructible. Is it a lot heavier? Smaller... Oh. Smaller quantities go further? The smaller quantities go further and Specific gravity, if you will, is greater, yes. I guess the, I get right to it. Is, do you think it would be easier or more difficult to smuggle into the United States? A lot easier. It could be brought in many different methods. Such as? Under a boat, directly in the water. It wouldn't have any effect on it. Dropped off offshore and left underwater for a few days, and then picked up by a pleasure boat later on. Water damage is, is not a problem with the... Uh, the base. Is there any indication that that the cartel is thinking in those terms? Indications? No, but I can state that one of the last shipments I received in late 84 had 150 kilos of base, which I was told to ship to uh, New Orleans for processing in a laboratory in New Orleans. Excuse me one moment. If, because of the pro physical protection they provide themselves and the protection they receive from police agencies in Colombia, is there any way to apprehend these cartel leaders when they're in third countries do they travel a lot do they head to paris for the weekend do they head off to to uh, you know i mean oh they do travel a lot and it is possible to grab them a third country if the state department would cooperate with enforcement why do you say if the state department would cooperate with enforcement well, an operation was planned oh not too long ago i think Mr. Gregor would be able to give you more information on it, where they had information that Ochoa would be landing in Caracas, Jorge Ochoa, and plans were set up to take him in Caracas and bring him back to the United States. The operation, to my understanding, was negated by the State Department. Because of its foreign policy implications? I would assume so. Obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, when they travel, although they travel with security, I assume they're much more vulnerable than definitely, they are. Definitely, definitely much more vulnerable. And tell me a little bit more, if you know, about their, about their personal habits in terms of, uh, uh, well, their personal habits. Do they spend uh, most of their time in Colombia? Do they, uh, you know, uh, is someone with that much money, is their recreation found uh, totally within Colombia, or are they? Definitely not, Senator. I'm sure that as, at least Escobar and one or two of your shows were at the Olympic Games in Seoul. They traveled to the bullfights in Mexico City and in Spain. Fabio Ochoa Jr. is a bullfight aficionado and considers himself a first-class bullfighter himself. They do a lot of traveling, you know, depending upon their own hobbies. World-class soccer games will take them out of their country into whatever country is holding the World Cup matches. Let me ask you one final question. What... Uh, What is it that you would like to be able to transmit to the federal authorities that they're not paying attention to? You said you wanted to cooperate more in the very Basi beginning of your testimony. Basically, that this is 
one nation under God, and should be treated as such, not as one nation under the DEA, one nation under the FBI, one nation under customs, one nation under the Democrats, and one nation under the Republicans. If everybody gets together and the American people step in behind them, this thing can be stopped, and stopped quickly. It's just a matter of cooperation amongst ourselves. You indicated that uh, the degree to which cocaine is controlled um, out of Colombia, and you gave us your assessment of the degree to which each area controls that supply. Is there much or any cooperation with other organized crime units in the United States? Do the Colombian cartels, for example, uh, do business with a mafia? Uh, do they? Uh, we were told to stay away from them. They did not trust them, and nor would they do business on a direct basis with them. They they don't trust the mafia. That's correct. Uh, I, I I'll try not to be smart here. Um, they specialize basically in ripping off a ship, and if you're out to make a delivery to a mafia representative, chances are he's going to steal it and blow you away without paying for it. I They've see. had that happen on several occasions, and they just stopped all business completely. So I if see. they want any of the cocaine coming out of Colombia, I would assume that they're dealing with a middleman or two, three steps down the road. I see. Excuse me. Um, you had mentioned uh, uh, Cuba, the Bahamas, and I believe Jamaica. And Haiti. And Haiti. Uh, to what degree, to your first-hand knowledge, uh, is there corruption among the elected or appointed officials in those countries? In Bahamas, it goes straight up to the top. Now, I was personally offered by a representative of the Bahamian government a deal, this was in late 1984, where I would be allowed to purchase all the cocaine confiscated in the Bahamas for shipment to the United States. Say Otherwise, that again? Or, I was offered a deal by a Bahamian official, so much per kilo for any cocaine that was confiscated by the Bahamian government. They were ready to sell it to me for distribution in the United States. They wanted it set up on a partnership deal. It would cost $2,000 a kilo to pay, for the pe pay off the people that were guarding it, plus the various low-level ministers. Brought to the United States, my people would be responsible for bringing it to the United States, sold to the United States, and then split profits 50 50 50% 50 Bahamian government, 50% cartel. How did you respond to that? We were setting it up, but I was arrested at the time. <laughs> How about Jamaica? One of the pilots that flew for us on an occasional basis used Jamaica as a stop off point. Some of the people from Cali were extremely involved with setting up laboratories and trying to grow the coca plant in Jamaica itself. Jamaica produces a fairly fine grid of coffee, compatible to the coffee out of Colombia. And when you can grow, grow good coffee, you can grow good coca. How about Cuba? We only had one instance with Cuba. One of our planes was forced down. Mechanical trouble, not by the Cuban Air Force in the southern part of Cuba. Came into a military air base and he figured it was over. But the commandant of the base told him no arrangements could be made, $10,000 anytime you want to land there. He would be allowed to land there under his personal supervision and allowed to take off again. In this case, he let him take off free because the pilot wasn't carrying any money, but the money was sent back. We never ran any further flights through Cuba. It was just a fluke. How successful, if any, attempts have been made to purchase and buy um, uh, political officials in this country has there been? Did you all, were you all in that business? Uh, I was not involved, no senator, and I know of nobody that was involved. 
So you know of no involvement with the cartel in actually attempting to and or succeeding in um, uh, bribing U.S. officials? Uh, uh, U.S. officials or U.S. politicians? Excuse me, U.S. politicians. Politicians, no. A good deal of U.S. officials are on payrolls. We never had any on ours, but we knew who did and what they were doing. How high up would those officials go? Street people. Street people? Yeah. Agents. Yeah. Anything you'd like to say before I close out the testimony? Anything you'd like to add? Just I hope this does some good and finally, you know, getting somebody to do something about what has to be done. And summarize again what you think most importantly has to be done. Eradication of the crop, number one. Eradication of the Colombian cartel, number two. Eradication of the crop by moving in with or without the, the uh, sanction of the government and eradication of the cartel primarily by physically um, uh, spiriting them away wherever they happen to be, Colombia or third countries. Correct, sir. Well, I thank you very much. Let me check with the staff to see if there's any additional questions they suggest I'd like to ask. Okay. There are none. Let me uh, once again now ask, please, the cooperation of the... Uh, um, by the way, I, have one, I do have one last question. Is there a contract out for you that you I know have of? been so informed, yes, sir. You've been so informed that there's a contract by the cartel out for your death and or kidnapping, or do you know? I've heard death, Senator, and... Just death? Yes, sir. They don't want you to visit again? I think I've annoyed them a little bit. Yeah. And do you have any idea that how much the contract is for? I've been told seven figures, but nobody will give me an exact amount. All right. Okay. I uh, will do all... And the reason I bother to men mention that is to impress upon the audience. It would be very useful if you would follow the directions of the U.S. Marshals. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask for the room to be cleared. But before I do, I want to tell everyone we will recess until 2 o'clock. We will hear our witnesses at... Uh, is it, what time do we tell them? Apparently we had formed you all. It would be 1.30, but I didn't think it would go this long. We'll, we'll recess until a quarter of 2. Uh, we'll take a 17, 18 minute break. Um, I would ask the uh, all to clear the room, beginning with the public and the press and then the staff, and uh, this hearing will be recessed until a quarter or two. Our coverage of this hearing, focusing on international drug control, will continue after we take a short break. <laughs>